Hello, Night Owls. We're really excited to have you here tonight. We're trying a new format that we've never tried before. Hopefully it's a lot of fun. So the reason we're doing this, um, there's a cool quote I'll read at the end to kind of wrap it up. But I feel like a lot of nature is um, just little impressions. A lot of our feelings about life and the world are little impressions that we get. And oftentimes that's through, through literature. And we've been working on several books that have really great um, ties into nature and um, eco-lit and um, causes that kind of protect the earth or something that has become very important to us. And um, we wanted to kind of celebrate that tonight and the role nature plays in, in making us all more aware of the world around us. So we would love anyone who would like to participate and um, feel free to use your theater voice or accents or whatever else, because if we have lags here, I'm going to make Carrie come on and do songs and dances for you. So protect Carrie and um, come do a reading with us. Uh, we have a lot of authors that have great sections that we probably should have reached out to, um, but we didn't wanna make it just about our, our little group of books because there's so many great ones out there. Um, but anyway, I hope that you will join and read with us. And oh, we already have some people jumping on. First of all, we're going to have Candace, and I'm very happy she's here because I feel like Candace has some amazing insights about um, a lot of things. But her her um, love of nature and the Gulf and the South um, is something that we have really loved discussing with her. So I'm excited that she's here, and I'm going to give you Candace. Hello, I'm so happy to see you. I'm happy to be here. Okay, so I did a picture book. Is that okay? Yes, definitely. I have a whole stack of like middle grades and YAs, but they're all arcs, so I can't uh, pick from those. <laughs> I can't quite from those. Um, can I mention them real quick though? Yeah, well, okay, because it's a picture book is done a long reading. Okay, so one that just came out in February is called The Last Bear. And this one um, is awesome because it's about friendship, but it's also about conservation and it tackles a huge issue like melting ice caps and the last polar bears and polar bear habitats and it's just an awesome book and then another one is um the queen bee and me this one came out in march of last year but it just won an honor book for the um the green earth book award like today i think oh. so it's about uh honeybees and how important honeybees are to our environment okay. but the um the uh little bit I wanted to read from is um, Earth by um, Stace McNulty and um, illustrated by David Lick Lickfield and it's the first 4.54 billion years. So oh, it pers puts Earth as a 4.5 year old child rather than 4.54 billion years. So it's a really hilarious book. But the one I really part that I picked to um, so just read a little bit of is about how um, it talks about how the earth formed, but then in the end of the book, it goes into what humans have really, how they've impacted it. So she says, humans have been really fun. No other species have ever been interested in learning about me. Other animals are nice, but they mostly eat and poop and never wonder about my amazing life. Of course, the illustrations are awesome. But sometimes humans forget to share and play nice and clean up after themselves. Still, I bet you humans will turn out to do really great things. And there's a picture of the banner, we love Earth. Uh -huh. So the whole book is about how awesome Earth is. And then it talks about how we kind of do a little bit of bad things, but it ends with such a hopeful note that that's why it's one of my favorite books because we still have time to make things better. And that's a big thing to hold on to, I feel like, because things get so sad and scary sometimes. So that's why I like this one. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, Can Candace, will you? I meant to have you tell people your name and where you're from. Oh, uh, Candace Marley Connor from Mobile, Alabama. Oh, I love your accent. And also, 
I we we went back and forth about having him read a, a section of your book. I wondered if you just like even your foreword about having a wild swamp childhood or your your dedication to your parents. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about that your little wild swamp childhood and how that impacted your love of nature and um, your region especially. Well, I often joke that I grew up in a swamp, but I really grew up on a fish farm. So I guess it wasn't much different because the fish farm was ponds in between swamps and rivers. So that's where I spent most of my time. And because I spent so much time there, I developed a deep appreciation for it. And I didn't really understand what that meant until I moved off a little bit and realized how important it was and how unique of an area it was also and so that made me appreciate even more um yeah I love that thank you and so once I moved off it was easier to write about it because then it's um it was memories mixed in with everything else I love that a great answer All right thank you so much Candice I appreciate you and tell Candice in the comments how much you loved her reading and I'm totally going to check out that book it looks adorable all right, thank you so much. Thank you. We have one of our cute teen author boot camp. Uh, I shouldn't say cute. I'm sorry. You're very mature and lovely. Yay. Can you tell everyone sorry. your name and where you're from? Um, I'm Maria and I live in Utah. And she's one of our favorite teen author boot camp team. <laughs> okay, tell us what you're doing tonight, Maria. Um, I'm going to read an excerpt from Anne of Avonlea, which is the book that I'm in right now. Then, and it's a piece that I really appreciate. An August afternoon with blue hazes scarfing the harvest slopes, little winds whispering elfishly in the poplars, and a dancing splendor of red poppies outflaming against the dark coppice of young firs in the corner of the cherry orchard. It was filter for dreams and dead languages. Thank you. That's beautiful. What what does that passage do for you? I really enjoyed the imagery of it. Um, just the colors and the descriptions that Ellen Montgomery gives in this piece. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Anything else you'd like to add? Um, nope. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for coming on. I love those books. They're so beautiful. I remember the description of Anne seeing the island for the first time or the, the valley where Matthew Merle's house is. And just, you're right, just such beautiful descriptions of. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Maria. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. And I loved Maria's because I, Anne speaks to my soul, but also Candace's because. Um, children's books speak to my soul too i'm very much a child at heart um speaking of children mine is from um a younger book it's one i chose to do one so i wasn't competing with a lot of um newer books but i chose to do one uh that kind of um spoke to me when i was younger the first time that i really appreciated uh nature and um all that it had to encompass in a book so um, I chose The Call of the Wild by Jack London, and it's not a fun, fancy looking book, but it's well loved. Mm -hmm. um, and I chose this quote from it. It says, but especially he loved to run in the dim twilight of the summer midnights, listening to the subdued and sleepy murmurs of the forest, reading signs and sounds as a man may read a book and seeking for the mysterious something that called, called waking or sleeping at all times for him to come. Um, and I think it spoke to me then and still does to me now um, for a lot of reasons, but I feel like there's always a call to nature, um, whether it be a season that you like um, and something that draws you to it. There's always a, a call to reconnect with nature. And I felt that it was so, um, it spoke so much to my soul then just because I think that um, the forest and getting away from everything was something uh, that I liked doing and still like doing. And uh, the way that they painted the picture of him talking about it, reading a book like a man reads a book, I liked that parallel a lot. Um, but I think that, I don't know, it's just something that I really liked that spoke to me, the book itself, 
is one that has a lot of emotion in it, um, especially for a young kid, lots of ups and downs and roller coasters of things that you can feel. And um, I think it just stuck out to me because it, it really summed up how you, you can feel drawn to something. And I, I really appreciated that. So that's mine. I love that. I love how um, you talked about how everybody feels that draw in different ways, whether it's a season or, you know, the mountains or the ocean or everybody feels it in different ways. But I feel like we all kind of crave that time with with nature and with earth. An excellent passage. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay, my book that I have um, always loved uh, that made a big impression on me was The Secret Life of Bees. And I don't remember how old I was when I first read this. I was a teenager, but it really, um, it really impacted me then. The reason I've always loved this book is because, um, well, it, I love it now for different reasons than when I was a teenager, but I, there's so many lessons about community and grief and it's just a beautiful story. The writing is phenomenal, but um, I wanted to read this passage about the first time she, um, she goes to a hive. She says, August placed her fingers to her lips, signaling me to be quiet. She lifted off her helmet and laid the side of her face flat against the top of the hive box. Come listen, she whispered. I removed my hat, tucking it under my arm, and placed my face next to hers so that we were practically nose to nose. You hear that, she asked. A sound rushed up, a perfect hum, high-pitched and swollen, like someone had put the tea kettle on and it had come to a boil. They're cooling the hives down, she said, and her breath broke over my face with the smell of spearmint. That's the sound of 100,000 bee wings fanning the air. She closed her eyes and soaked it in the way you imagine people at a fancy orchestra concert drinking up highbrow music. I hope it's not too backward to say that I felt like I had never heard anything on my hi-fi back home that came out that good. You would have to hear it yourself to believe the perfect pitch, the harmony parts, how the volume rolled up and down. We had our ears pressed to a giant music, music box. Then the whole side of my face started to vibrate as if the music had rushed into my pores. I could see August's skin pulsing the tiniest bit. When we stood back up, my cheek prickled itch. You are listening to bee air conditioning, August said. Most people don't have any idea about all the complicated life going on inside a hive. Bees have a secret life we don't know anything about. I loved the ideas of bees having a secret life. And I have loved bees ever since then. My biggest wish in life is to have a, a honeybee farm. And um, it's just in the last few years where they've really been talking more about how about how everything's interconnected, how essential bees are to um, crops and everything else. And so um, that that's when I started my love affair with bees, but I've, I've seen them become more and more um, popular, which is awesome because people talk about them more. Even the, the book that Candace mentioned um, that just won an award, I feel like just teaching kids early on how important they are and how everything's interconnected is um, such an important part of, of literature. Yes, thank you. It's The Queen Bee and Me by Gillian McDunn. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, I can't wait to read it. Anyway, I just think bees are, bees are beautiful and wonderful and perfect and so brilliant. And anyway, the floor is all yours. Okay. And you can introduce yourself. I'm Hannah Smith. I live in Virginia. Um, you guys are talking about bees, which are my favorite thing. And they release the bees. We have a lot of apple okay. orchards. Anyway, they release the bees in just a few weeks for all the orchards that are around us. So we, we don't have them until the orchards release them because they're, I grew up with bees everywhere. Like they were buzzing all the time and now we hardly ever see any. Like I followed them around the yard and I'm like, be safe, be like I try to protect them. We just get bees now in the, in the spring for just a couple of weeks before they all get poisoned, I guess. Anyway, they, they do. I was from Utah and they would all box up their bees in big semi trucks and take them to California to fertilize the orchards there every year. And there, there's like, sorry, there's documentaries on people who still be like they steal beehives. That's how they make their money is they steal people's beehives and sell them. Anyway, there's this whole interesting I can't believe we've never talked about this, but probably now is not the time. Anyway, go on. We could just talk about bees the whole time. I would love it. My friend, one of my friends today took a picture of a whole Luna moth in her yard. And I was like, that's so perfect for Earth Day. I've never seen one of those in my entire life. 
and it was perfect they're like huge and it oh. like the wings weren't damaged and I was like I'm coming over I want to see it but I never did <laughs> so the book I was going to read is where the crawdads sing and I think I love the details of a story and especially in nature like your little wall Emma behind you is just all the little fun details I could just look at it all day and so this book is just full of the details of the south and she spreads a lot of little lines everywhere. It's just peppered with lots of descriptions. So I had a really hard time finding even two sentences strung together. But I have a little piece I'm going to read. Just before dark, Kaya walked back to the beach where the gulls were preening and settling in for the night. As she waded into the surf, shards of shells and chips of crabs brushed her toes as they tumbled back to the sea. She reached down and picked up two pelican feathers, just like the one Tate had put in the piece section of the dictionary, but part of the story. The next morning before dawn, Kaya sat up in her porch bed and breathed the rich scents of the marsh into her heart. As faint line light filtered into the kitchen, she cooked herself some grits, scrambled eggs, and biscuits as light and fluffy as Ma's. She ate every bite, then as the sun rose, she rushed to her boat and chugged across the lagoon, dipping her fingers into the clear deep water. Turning through the channel, she spoke to the turtles and egrets and lifted her arms high above her head. Home. I'll collect all day anything I want she said anyway so I just love all the details of the south with the all the creatures and the just the beauty I love the beauty of nature and that's what I get hung up about I guess and all the detail I love that also that book was so good yeah. and it has the best title ever <laughs> awesome thank you so much Hannah bye Okay, we have Bright Flame and then Olivia. Hello. Hi there, everybody. Tell us you. your name and where you're from. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, a colonized name is Pennsylvania. Okay. Well, it is so nice I, to see you. And this is indeed my name, and I do live on unceded uh, Lenape land. Eastern Pennsylvania. Uh, one of my favorite books is The Overstory by Richard Powers. And um, I scrambled to find a, a selection that makes sense to read. Uh, this is towards the end of the book. Um, for those who don't know the story, the forest is a character in the story. Um, forest. Uh, communicates with some humans and um, gives wisdom from Forrest's perspective. Um, lots of interesting stuff in there. And um, so this is one of the particular human characters who's, um, she's opened up to connection with the mycorrhizal network and with forest and she hears information um, so um, let's see the fear of suffering that is her birthright and that's the human the frantic need to steer blows away on the wind and something else wings down to replace it Messages hum from out of the bark she leans against. Chemical semaphores home in over the air. Currents rise from the soil gripping roots, relayed over great distances through fungal synapses, linked up in a network the size of the planet. The signals say a good answer is worth reinventing from scratch again and again. They say, the air is a mix we must keep making. They say, there's as much below ground as above. They tell her, do not hope or despair or predict or be caught surprised. Never capitulate, but divide, multiply, transform, conjoin, do, and endure as you have all the long day of life. 
There are seeds that need fire, seeds that need freezing, seeds that need to be swallowed, etched in digestive acid, expelled as waste, seeds that must be smashed open before they'll germinate. A thing can travel everywhere just by holding still. And it goes on, but these are some of the messages from Forrest. And the whole book, the way he constructs it, feels like he was really channeling Forrest. So, um, and that's part of my work in the world to really represent the trees and the forests and the non-human world, centering them, giving them agency in a lot of my own speculative writing. And it's the kind of work I'm drawn to. So. That's so beautiful. Thank you. I love that. I wrote down the name of that. I'll look it up. The Overstory, right? Right, right by Richard Powers. Powers. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. And you have an excellent reading voice. You sound like a writer. You, you have <laughs> an excellent energy. Thank you so much for sharing. That was beautiful. You're welcome. Any, anything else you want to say? Well, I was also drawn to read from Robin Wall Kimmerer's uh, writing Sweetgrass, which is another mainstay that I turn to over and over, nonfiction. Um, she's uh, an indigenous woman from many different um, tribes, um, and she's a botanist. Uh, so she melds science and indigenous knowing, so Western and indigenous sciences, and um, talks to us about um, how we can be in relationship with the earth, how we can decenter humans and just be part of nature, which is like right relationship with the rest of the world. So there's a lot of wisdom in that. And, and she tells a lot of stories about her work, her culture um, that are just ripe with uh, wisdom and important information uh, for living in sustainable and regenerative ways. Wow. I love so that. that one too. <laughs> okay, I wrote it down. Thank you so much for joining. It was so fascinating. I could talk to you all night. <laughs> <laughs> well, you. another time. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're welcome. I love the different experiences of different people from different places. It's so fascinating. Okay, so I really appreciated Bright Flames reading. That was a really beautiful one that just kind of swept me up. Yeah, um, yeah it's just... It's nice to consider our relationship with nature instead of just thinking about what we can get from nature. <laughs> um, the I'm going to read from Paul Rosalie's book, The Girl and the Tiger, because I really loved his description of um, the forests in India. And um, so his his book is about a girl who finds a tiger cub in this small patch of forest near her house in India. And she works to return it to the only forest that's left, um, uh, the only jungle that's left in India. And so it was interesting for me to read it because I kind of think of India as like a place full of jungles and like cities and jungles. But in reality, it's, it's become a lot more plantations and there's really only one um, forest left. And one thing I really liked about Paul's writing is that occasionally he, slips in, into the perspective of an animal and kind of um, sees the world through their eyes. So this excerpt I'm going to read is um, from a, the tiger cub's perspective. The tiger had no name. She was born in a forest up the Malabar coast beneath a blood moon. Her mother, a great long striped tiger of three years, blind cubs clean as they squirmed helpless, one male, one female. The tiger's first weeks of life were spent blindly suckling beside her brother on the warm white striped stomach of their mother, mother thunder breath, mother wild eyes. Those were her first memories, the smell of the earthen den and her mother's giant godlike form curled all around, her soft fur rising and falling with warm breath, licking her clean, rumbling songs of the jungle into her new ears. Though the cub was new to the world and her mother only a few years older, 
they played in the sunset of a story many thousands of years old. I could go on and on. I feel like I could read, <laughs> I could read a lot of that story. Um, but I just really like um, imagining that family unit of tigers um, and they deserve space to have a family just like we have spaces to have our families. And um, yeah, so I just really recommend that book for anyone um, who hasn't read it. I love that. Thank you, Olivia. Olivia was an amazing editor on it who helped whip it into, into shape. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm actually really glad you introduced it because I, I want to end tonight with a quote from Paul um, at the end of his book, um, kind of a note from the author at the end. And so I'm glad Olivia introduced the book because it really is beautiful. Um, here's the cover so you can kind of see this is he loved this cover because it was taken by somebody in the forest where where he saw his first tiger so that's kind of the story behind uh the cover i just wanted to share um that last week we had um last thursday we had a facebook live about the titanic that i thought was really phenomenal i i learned a lot from it olivia interviewed ashley Coles, who is the author of The Poppy and the Rose, which is based on the Titanic. And so for the anniversary of the Titanic sinking, we had a discussion about some of the history behind that. And I really loved learning about the new stories, uh, about the stories of some of the people that we we don't hear as often. So if you haven't had a chance to um, watch that, you can watch the replay here on Facebook. Um, but I would recommend checking that out. And um, The Poppy and the Rose, um, is our April book of the month. So through the end of the month, it's 99 cents. So grab that while you can. And if there's nobody else that wants to read, um, I I wanted to share this quote from Paul. I, I wanted him to be on here tonight, but apparently things um, don't happen as much as I would like them to with internet connections in the jungle. I know, go figure. Um, but he's amazing because he, he lives most of his life in the jungle. Um, trying to save the land and really um, educate. Uh, one of the things I love about him is I think a lot of conservationists have this conflict between, um, but the animals need this and um, we need to do that at whatever cost. And Paul Rizzoli has a really unique balance of the people need this, the indigenous people need this, and the animals need this, and how can we help them coexist, and how can we make this a future that works for everyone, and so I think he's brilliant, he's kind, and um, just a really phenomenal person, so he, he spends most of his life in the jungle, and um, without internet connections, and such, but I wanted to close with um, this quote from his book because it kind of sums up what we're trying to do here and and every I've loved how everybody touches on different parts of nature and different authors, because I think as readers um, we're so we take these little snippets from all of the books we read and that creates our worldview and um, so I just want to read this, he said. Uh, Many novels and movies take great care to state that any resemblance the story or characters have to people living or dead is purely coincidental. I cannot make such a claim. The Girl and the Tiger is less my own creation and more a collection of moments, truths, and legends I found over the years in the Indian jungle. It is a necklace of a book, a series of seeds and teeth, stones and bones, gathered like beads from the forest floor. I only add the string. It is the result of following elephants, searching for tigers, sitting late into the night around campfires, and becoming acquainted with the tribes of the forest, both human and animal. And it's such a beautiful, he's, he's just poetic and he's a beautiful writer. It's a beautiful way to describe this book, but all books in general. A lot of um, people who listen here are authors and what you're doing is taking the stories you've collected and giving your own version of that. And when you read, you absorb somebody else's collection of stories and insights into the world. And so that's what I hope, um, I, that's what we hoped um, would be the takeaway on Earth Day is that there's so many beautiful glimpses of nature in literature and, um, and it's an easy, not an easy way, but it's an important way and a um, intentional way that we can help um, educate and help contribute to um, making the world a better place. Like Candace said, it's not too late to change um, the trajectory of, of using up the earth and um, 
abusing her in a lot of ways and just changing that trajectory and through our writing and our reading, I think that that is an essential way that we can do that. So I hope that you found this useful tonight. I know I have several books I need to go read now. And um, I really appreciate those of you who came on and read. I know it's kind of scary and um, I don't know all of you and you just showed up and I really appreciate that. And I think we should do this again some other time, but thank you so much for being here tonight. I really appreciate you and I hope you have a fabulous Earth Day and do something today to make the world a better place and have a good night. Subscribe to our channel so you'll never miss an upload or join us live every Thursday for author interviews, book clubs, writing advice, and more on Facebook at Owl Hollow Press, 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. See you Thursday.